We have a great session planned for you today, uh, but before we begin, I'd like to share some more information about the IWA Digital Water Program and the Digital Water IWA subgroup. India subgroup, sorry. The Digital Water Program in IWA aims to act as a catalyst for innovation, knowledge and best practices uh, around digitalization for the water industry. Uh, it provides a platform to share experiences and to promote leadership in transitioning to digital water solutions and it consolidates lessons to guide the natural evolution from the business as usual to achieving a digital water utility. The program is driven by end users as well as solution providers at the forefront of emerging technologies to solve urgent and costly operational problems to deliver water services. A steering committee chaired by Oliver Greeson guides the program in collaboration with the IWA Secretariat. Now regarding the organizers of this webinar, Digital Water India subgroup, uh, their purpose is to have a regional emphasis where members can exchange knowledge, pinpoint gaps, and develop effective digital solutions for India. Uh, the proposed subgroup's goal is to use digital tools and technologies such as artifi artificial intelligence, data analytics, machine learning, augmented reality and virtual reality, digital twins, and others to address problems in the water sector throughout India, uh, potentially Southeast Asia as well. And uh, this is to encourage the digital water revolution in India. And the subgroup will also draw on the worldwide IWA knowledge base and expertise. And now I would like to introduce our speakers for today. So we have um, two expert speakers, Pilar and or three actually, three expert speakers, uh, Pilar Conejos, uh, Dr. Sian Lun Lao, and uh, Professor Amlan Chakra Bhatti. But uh, just to give you a bit of background on Pilar, she is a digital twin manager at Idrica and a part-time associate professor at the University of Valencia. And uh, since 2023, she's been a member of the IWA Digital Water Program's steering committee. She is an industrial engineer and holds a PhD in the Hydraulic Engineering and Environment Program from uh, the University of Valencia. Pilar has 25 years of experience in the water sector. She worked in the company Global Omnium, where she, ha where she was responsible for network control and operation in the Great Valencia for 15 years. Pilar will present to you today on the digital transformation journey towards a digital twin. Uh, Dr. Xion Lun Lao uh, received his doctorate in engineering and master's in electrical communication engineering from the University of Kassel in Germany. He also holds a Bachelor of Engineering with honors in electronics and telecommunications engineering from University of Malaysia, Sarawak. During his nine years as a researcher at the Chair for Communication Technology at the University of Kassel, he has worked and managed various German, national and EU funded research projects. Among them are the EU IST Mobile Life, ITA, ITEA, S for All and others. He joined Sunwe University Malaysia in February 2013 as a senior lecturer and the head of the Department of Computing and Information Systems until 20, March 2021. He is currently a professor at the Department of Computing and Information Systems and also holds the role of Deputy Dean for the School of Engineering and Technology. He's currently a senior member of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and serves as the vice chair of the IEEE Computer Society Malaysia chapter for the term 2023 to 2024. His research, in, his research interests include ubiquitous computing, sustainable smart cities, context awareness and applied machine learning. His recent, recent research projects include Deep Spray, Sust Hack, Mosti, Tattoo Radic and Impact Exchange. Today, Professor uh, Shion, uh, 
Dr. Shen will talk about uh, towards sustainability through digitization, the Malaysia context. And last but by no means least, Professor Amlan Chakrabati is a pioneering IoT and data analytics researcher for digital water management and sustainability. He is the professor and director of the School of IT at the University of Calcutta, India, where he leads innovative research in data science and its applications in environmental and biomedical domains. Means. Amlan is also a distinguished speaker of the IEEE Computer Society, recognized for his contributions to cutting edge techn technological advancements. He serves as the chair of, as the co-chair of the IWA Digital Water India subgroup, focusing on leveraging digital solutions for water resource challenges, and is a series editor for the Springer book series on water informatics, promoting research at the intersection of technology and water management. Additionally, Amlan is a member of the IEEE Standards Committee on AI and Design Automation, contributing to global standards in artificial intelligence and automation technologies. His leadership and research continue to drive innovation in sustainable practices, particularly through the IoT-based water management systems, aligning with global efforts to achieve sustainable development goals in water and sanitation. Amlan's work bridges academia, industry, and policy, making him a prominent figure in advancing digital water solutions and sustainability. Today, uh, Professor Amlan will uh, guide the interactive discussion between Dr. Shion and uh, Pilar. And uh, I forgot to do this at the beginning, but my name is Erin Jordan and I coordinate the uh, IWA Digital Water Program. So uh, Pilar, over to you. Thanks, Erin, for your kind introduction. And thanks, everyone, for joining this webinar. It's really a pleasure for me to be here with all of you and share our experience because it's what we are going or I am going to, to do. So uh, I, I'm going to share my screen in order to start my presentation. So perfect. Uh, can you see my screen? Not as yet. Not? And now, can you see? Yes. 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 Perfect. <laughs> So the title of my presentation is Digital Transformation Journey Towards a Digital Twin for Water Networks. Um, here I, we can see uh, more or less the topics uh, that I will try to cover in my presentation. First, I will speak about our experience in Digital Twins. Uh, next, I will speak something about the Digital Twin concept. And we'll see uh, a real use case example of application of Digital Twin uh, to a water distribution network with the case of Valencia City. And finally, I will share with you uh, some lessons learned. So first of all, uh, I would like to like share uh, this message with all of you because uh, we understand like, that uh, the journey towards a digital twin is much more a process rather than a one-time solution. Because we are going to see that uh, we have to take uh, several steps uh, until we achieve a digital twin. So uh, let's start about uh, our experience. So first of all, Idrica, the company that I work today, uh, is a technological company that provides services and technology under the brown silent view uh, to help uh, utilities to manage the, the entire water cycle. But we can say that Idrica is the result of a success uh, a story. Uh, the story of the, the digitalization of the uh, global Omnium, utility in Global Omnium. So who is uh, Global Omnium? Uh, global Omnium uh, is an utility that manages more than 3 million customers, uh, most of them in Spain. Uh, it manages 400 municipalities and 21 uh, drinking water treatment plants and 400 wastewater uh, treatment plants. And the most important city that uh, Global Omnium is managing today is uh, the city of Valencia. 
So uh, visibility started the digitalization process a long time ago, uh, indeed uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so as a result of this digitalization of this digital process, uh, a spin-off, Idrica, was created um, to help other utilities in this process and also to deliver uh, the solutions that really were uh, useful for us in Global Omnium. In fact, as Erin said uh, in, her, uh, in my introduction, uh, I worked in Global Omnium for more than 20 years uh, as head of water network in Valencia, and uh, recently I joined Idrica to help other utilities. But what were our drivers uh, to start this digitalization, this digital process until uh, having a digital twin? So as I said, we started a long time ago, 20 years ago, uh, and we started because uh, at that time, we had to face uh, several challenges. One of them was uh, water scarcity. Uh, in Spain, and specifically in Valencia, that is located in the east coast of Spain, uh, we are used to having droughts. And now what we have seen is that uh, we have uh, droughts with much more frequency. So 20 years ago, we were very uh, concerned about the, the, the water scarcity uh, because we had like growing population and at the same time, water scarcity. And moreover, uh, we had uh, two more challenges. One was uh, infrastructures near their maximum capacity, uh, and finally, keep people in the company near the retirement age. So we realized that we needed something <laughs> that could help us uh, to face these challenges, to plan the new infrastructures that uh, were going to be needed in order to deliver water to everyone, um, and also to be very efficient uh, with the use of water, uh, because um, in that situation, water sc scarcity, infrastructures near their maximum capacity, really uh, there is no room for any mistake, and operating the water network in that situation is really uh, challenging. So here we have our two main drivers for starting the digitalization process. Was One was uh, the, the need of increase the sustainability of the system, and the second one is to, uh, the need to increase the security. Uh, so, as we started our uh, digital journey a long time ago, 20 years ago, uh, really we had to, to build our own path because there were not a lot of utilities that uh, had gone uh, through this, through this uh, journey, and also we have to deliver uh, or to the or to deliver and also to design uh, our own solutions. So in 2000, more or less, is when we started. Uh, we already have, uh, we already had uh, in the utility in Global Omnium uh, some digital solutions really important for uh, operating the system. One was the Skiria to operate uh, remotely the network, and the other one was the GIS as a digital uh, uh, geographical inventory of all the assets. And also we have hydraulic models for, for hydraulic models, but much for planning because uh, it's true that we had a hydraulic models at that time, but they were only uh, able to simulate the behavior of the network at one specific moment. Like they were like a photo, a static photo of the, of the network. Uh, that really they were useful for planning because they, uh, were, they were able to represent uh, the day of maximum consumption, of the, the day of the average consumption, but really it was very difficult to update and finally it was very difficult to, to use them. So when we started to have these three challenges that I, I said before in my presentation, we decided uh, or we came up with the idea of connecting the hydraulic models, the simulation models, uh, with information provided by the SCADA in order to feed this model with real-time uh, data and to be able to simulate the behavior of the network in real time. And this was something, something great because uh, from 2007, uh, we have uh, our hydraulic model connected with uh, all the information provided by the SCADA and the sensors, and we have been able for, since then uh, to simulate the behavior of the network in real time. And this is something very useful because uh, we can like uh, have a better understanding of the system as we are going to see uh, later, and also uh, to be able to to run what if scenarios, what we call what if scenarios. What what is going to happen if I close this pipe? What is going to happen if I 
uh, put out of service this plant or what is going to happen if I uh, increase the capacity of this plant. So we start, I have to say that we started in 2003 with this idea as a research project in, uh, uh, together with the university. And finally, in, two, in 2007, uh, we had our first version. But the digitalization of the company uh, continued. So we started to install much more sensors in the network, not only the ones uh, managed by the SCADA, uh, but others. And we also started inside the company uh, to develop uh, other solutions for data management, like uh, uh, managing the non-revenue water or work orders. I think we, uh, we made uh, a really <laughs> brave decision about to install uh, smart meters in the network because we wanted to, to have a better understanding of the final use of the water. And we decided in 2006 to install uh, automatic meter readings. So it was great because uh, one operator uh, in the street could like uh, read at the same time several uh, water meters. But we moved uh, from automatic read reading, meter reading to automated uh, meter infrastructure uh, in order uh, to have uh, with much more frequency uh, the readings because with automated meter infrastructure what we can have is like every uh, smart meters can send automatically uh, the reading to our control center. So here we can see like the evolution of the smart meters installed in the network. So in 2018, we had more than uh, half a million of smart meters. And uh, I think uh, Valencia was the first uh, city in Europe where every user had its own smart meters. It's true that we, uh, we, we didn't only install uh, smart meters, we install also other uh, flow meters uh, in the pipes and also pressure meters. And finally, uh, what we had is a, <laughs> a huge amount of data. Here we can see like the evolution of metering data from 2006 to, to 2018. Imagine that we, we, we had in the end of 2019 this uh, huge amount of data that had to be managed. So at that time we had data, but no what? know what, uh, what we are going to do with this data. So it's when we decided in 2018 uh, to move from a data-centric platform. So what we had is um, uh, to integrate and normalize and concentrate in a single platform all the data coming from the different sources, from the SCADIAs, from the GIS, uh, from, all the, uh, from all the smart meters. And finally, what we did is to connect all this data with the simulation mo uh, models in order uh, to have uh, a digital twin. So we are, we have, uh, or we, uh, I have uh, spoken about our experience, about our evolution, our journey in Global Omnium. Uh, but I said in the end we had a digital twin, but I haven't defined the digital twin so far. So it's true that a digital twin has a lot of definitions, uh, but uh, here in this slide I have one that I, I like the most, and I think it's very simple. A digital twin is a, a virtual copy uh, of the real system that represents its behavior continuously and serves as basis for experimentation. What, what does it mean? That when we have a digital twin, we replicate continuously the behavior of the network. This is pretty important because it's the capability that makes different uh, a digital twin from other systems. And when we have it, we can like test and try new ideas, new changes, new operations in the virtual system before making the decision in the real system. So what we are doing is like uh, reducing time, uh, cost, and increasing the security of, the re of our decisions because we can know beforehand uh, what's going to, to happen. So when we have a digital twin, in the end, what we can do is monitor the entire system, analyze its behavior, the behavior of the, of the entire system, simulate the behavior of the system. This is the capability uh, that makes different a digital twin because maybe with a SCADIA we can monitor the, the system with some sensors, but with a digital twin we can simulate the behavior of the network under the real conditions or any other. And finally, what we can do is to improve the real system because in the end the goal of everything, the digitalization is to improve the real system. So 
here in this slide, we can see like the main components uh, that we need for uh, developing a digital twin. We need first uh, data. This is one of the pillars of a digital twin and one of the pillars of the digitalization, because in the end, digitalization uh, is about extracting value from data. Uh, and in the, same, uh, in the same way, a digital twin needs data to be built. Of course, we need real data because the digital twin has to be continuously paired uh, uh, with a, a real system. So uh, not offline data, uh, real data is needed. Uh, we need simulation models. And here we can use uh, different simulation models. We can use deterministic models, um, such as uh, hydraulic models, as we are uh, used uh, in Valencia. But we can also use other models, like, for example, data-driven models, like AI models, uh, to simulate uh, complex models where the deterministic models um, really uh, don't work. And finally, we need analytics so that combining the information provided by data and simulation models we can make uh, decisions to improve the, the real system, the physical system, because in the end uh, is what we want to do. And here we have like the high level architecture and the needed inputs that uh, we would need uh, if we want to develop a digital twin or we want to uh, uh, have a digital twin. We need data. Uh, and here we, I have uh, I tried to put uh, all the sources of data that uh, an utility can have today. In an utility, we can have different systems deployed, like GIS. Mm, they are really a, a very good source of data because they contain all the uh, information about the, the assets. It's like a, uh, the our inventory of the assets. We have you can have sensors deployed in the network in real time or offline if they send information like three times per day or, for, or twice per day. We can have in the utility Scadia. The, the Scadia also uh, uh, contain a lot of uh, information provided by sensors. Uh, we even can have smart meters and computer is maintenance management system. So uh, combining this data with simulation models is when we have a digital twin. I have put here in this slide all the sources of data that we can use, but it doesn't mean that we have to have all the data uh, before starting a digital twin. We can start, for example, uh, developing a digital twin with information provided by sensors, some sensors in real time. And after that, like adding much more data to the digital twin in order to increase the confidence and accuracy. But we don't have to wait until we have all of this data. It's true that there are some data that is necessary, but the other is for improving uh, the accuracy of the system. And what we can, uh, what, uh, when we have that, uh, what we can do is to simulate the behavior of the network uh, in real time under the real conditions or any other, like I said before. What's going to happen if I uh, leave out of service an important asset? And in our case, uh, uh, what we uh, have done is uh, to simulate the, the, the behavior of the system in real time, but also at any past time or even in the future. For us, uh, the next future is 24 hours because this tool, uh, this system was thought uh, to be used uh, in the control room for improving like the daily operation. And finally, here in, in this slide, uh, we can see like the main figures uh, of our digital twin uh, deployed in the city of Valencia that really have been used uh, for 15 years. It's true that the generation or the version of the digital twin that we have today is very different from the first one that we delivered. But uh, it has been really useful because uh, it has been supporting uh, our daily operation for 15 years. So here we can see like the main figures, uh, the digital twin of the water distribution, drinking water uh, distribution network of Valencia contains 900 kilometers in length, contains all the regulating elements like pumps, tanks and valves, and it's connected in real time with information provided by 600 sensors. Most of them are pressure sensors and flow meters. And what happens that in the end, with 600 sensors, with 600 uh, monitorized points, what we can do is to simulate what's happening in the rest of the network. In our case, we can simulate what's happening in 10,000 uh, points of the network. They are called like soft sensors or virtual sensors uh, because uh, you can, we, we can see 
uh, we can know what's happening uh, in those points without the necessity of having like a, a physical sensors because we know what's happening because we are simulating uh, some parameters in this in these points. And as I said before, it has been really useful for us uh, for improving the daily operation and also uh, for improving the, the planning of the network. Regarding the, the daily operation, as I said before, we can uh, simulate the behavior of the network live, past and future. And this is, um, has been really useful for us uh, for having like uh, well estimated values at non metric points. In the past, we only uh, knew what was happening in the points where we had sensors. But now with the uh, digital twin, we know what's happening everywhere, thanks to the, capa the capability of the, of the digital twin to simulate the behavior of the network. This is something great because we can know uh, the pressure that uh, every pipe ha has, uh, the flow, uh, even the, some uh, water quality parameters like, like water age that they are really difficult to measure even with sensors. So we uh, increased uh, a lot uh, the understanding and the knowledge uh, about the performance of the system because the control was uh, beyond the sensors. It has been really useful for, the, uh, for supporting our uh, emergency situations because every time we had an emergency situation, we uh, tested uh, beforehand every action in the digital twin before making a decision in the real system. So uh, we were very secure uh, when implementing an action under emergency conditions because uh, we knew beforehand uh, if this action was going to be effective or not. And also for forecasting the behavior for the next 24 hours, this is something also useful because we can detect uh, some issues in the future and we can fix them uh, before they like, become uh, a big uh, problem. And also for planning, uh, as I said before, uh, our infrastructures were near the maximum capacity and we had to uh, uh, plan and design new infrastructures. Our digital twin uh, was useful also for, uh, for that uh, purpose because uh, we could like, assess the network requirements, uh, we could design the new infrastructures, we also could define the behavior of the, net, uh, of the new infrastructures beforehand because we could add temporarily these uh, new pipes, for example, that have to be built in the digital twin in order to see what was going to, to be its behavior. And finally, we could determine the commissioning stages if the uh, infrastructures are really uh, big. But I mentioned, I have mentioned, mentioned these uh, uses, but a, a digital twin can be used uh, for um, facing uh, nearly uh, uh, all the problems regarding the, the water distribution networks can be used for network planning uh, and also can be used for support the daily operation, as I said before, uh, detect anomalies, uh, improve our emergency response, optimize energy, non-revenue water, water quality, so it can be used uh, for different purposes. And finally, uh, some recommendations and lessons learned from our experience. Uh, I think, uh, and we think that uh, before starting a digitalization process, uh, we have to answer several questions uh, that uh, uh, we have, or I have put in this slide. First, we have to answer why. It's very important to define beforehand the purpose of the digitalization, like the objectives, like the benefits. This is something really important. The other question that we have to answer is what? Uh, we have to define the right organization, the business architecture, because in the end, uh, with the digitalization, some processes uh, are going to, to change in the, in the company. We have to answer also the, the question how. We have to define very well uh, the roadmap, the digital portfolio, uh, the projects, uh, the, the resources that we are going to need. And uh, last but not least, uh, of course, uh, who? We have to think about the final users uh, of the digitalization uh, and we have to involve the main stakeholders from the beginning because in the end, uh, people have to adopt the, the technology. And it's true that the path starts from wherever uh, we are. Uh, some uh, common uh, steps have to be taken, like for example, uh, installing some sensors, integrated sen integrating uh, these sensors in a platform, visualizing 
uh, the information coming from these sensors. We have to, we have to add analytics, and if we want to move uh, towards a digital twin, we have to add simulation models connecting with live data, and is when uh, if when we have a digital twin, when these models are connected with all the data, and we are and we have the capability of simulating, is when we have uh, a digital twin. Um, really uh, operating and from an experience uh, operating uh, a water distribution network is really challenging, very challenging because uh, we have to operate like the existing network with the a new network with the new infrastructures, and this is something uh, that sometimes is difficult. Uh, we know that uh, the level of the challenges that we have to face today are really uh, very, very big. So I think they only can be faced if we like uh, combine technology, engineering principles, and also uh, experience and the expertise of the people. Uh, and I can say from my experience that uh, the digital twins are one of the most advanced solutions in the digitalization process. Uh, but I think they are, they are, they are unique. Uh, why are they unique? Because they put under the same umbrella all the data, all the analytics, and they, they can provide us this a holistic view of the performance of the system. And I think for that purpose, uh, they, they are unique. And I cannot see like the, the, the limitations of the digital twins. I have shown some uses uh, that we have made of the digital twin, uh, for example, in Valencia, but I think I cannot see like uh, limitations. I only can see like opportunities uh, for them. So thanks for, for your attention. And that's all in my presentation. Uh, yeah, thank you, Pilar. Thank you, Pilar, for this excellent presentation. I will come back to you in the question answer hours. Okay, but uh, but now I will call Professor Lau uh, to start his presentation. Over to you, Professor Lau. All right. I just want to check whether you can hear me. I put us on the screen. Yeah, and uh, our point is also there. You can see me, right? Uh, the 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 slides. Yeah, fine. Everything is fine. Yeah. Okay. Good. good. Yeah. Um. Yeah. First of all, thanks for the the invitation, and uh, I'm I'm very glad Dr. Pilar already set the stage. So I'll probably skip some of the things that are overlapping, but focus more on sharing um on the topics more from the Malaysian context, and uh first just to to put it on on record um it's a rather new topic to me uh but I'm I'm so happy when I prepare and discuss with people, uh, I realize this is a, a very important uh, topic and I'm happy I found some uh, document, especially from the Academy of Science of Malaysia that I would like to share here with uh, everyone. Yeah, and uh, hopefully it's a, it's a good journey to exchange and uh, maybe generate some ideas about what we can do together. So, yeah. Um, a very quick run through. I think I'll mainly focus on the, the beginning, the challenges, the issues, and maybe some of the current state. And I, I hope um, some of these things maybe will resonate with the audience. Maybe many problems are similar, different places. Some of the countries may be leading and some are learning and uh, adapting very fast, but it is something uh, we all should pay attention to. And I think a little bit towards the solution and maybe something I would like to share what we are doing at the city where the university is. And um, I think the introduction is already done. And um, just, just to highlight a bit, if you know Malaysia a bit and you know the capital city and uh, where I am is in this place called Bandar Sunway or Sunway City. And uh, why this picture, maybe a little bit more, I will share towards the end of the presentation, but we are kind of one hour plus minus uh, away from the city center. Yeah, and to to kick off this uh, sharing, I think uh, a recent report uh, that Malaysia is, you know, facing this, this problem is, you know, a third of the treated water that's supposed to be coming to household that we can use as, um, you know, drinking water and so on. Actually, a third of them never reach the household, means the uh, NRW, the non-revenue water percentage is actually um, pretty high. And um, imagine every one liter 
know, 30% of it is actually wasted. Yeah, so I think all these things um, raise a, a rather alarming um, kind of um, signal, right? And as I dive into the topic and read up, I realized that all these issues, we, this is why it's happening uh, and in Malaysia, why water security is an issue we must pay attention. And uh, these are some of the factors maybe uh, would be good to share with each other. Um, Malaysia have undergone a quite rapid um, growth right, in the recent years and the urbanization and especially industrialization is probably one of the major issue. The demand for water has uh, also increased. And this itself creates uh, different issues because of the increasing demand, um, the management of it must catch up with the, also the demand that is coming, right? And such thing can actually, if unplanned, create a um, burden, right, to the provider, to the government, even the users when they are disruption. And um, in many countries, I, I believe it's similar when the regions are being developed and um, will build infrastructure. But at the same time, it's, it's probably hard to expect that every single region in the country can have equal development and the same thing with water supply also. And therefore, you can definitely foresee um, in, let's say, the urban area, uh, the um, distribution can be more available, right, compared to, let's say, the non urban area. And this distribution, right, especially during the dry season, uh, can then uh, suddenly cause some of this uh, disruption, right? Uh, while even in the cities where the demand is high, it also will struggle to cope, right? Also, so that uneven distribution can actually be some issues uh, a country must look into also. And I think this will be more common, let's say, in the developing countries, right? Um, but pollution happens everywhere. Um, river pollution itself will, will affect water quality. And I remember um, probably five, six years ago, there were constant uh, disruption, right? Because the water catchment area, uh, the, let's say, water near the uh, water treatment plant uh, has been polluted for whatever reason. And therefore, the, the water treatment plant has to be shut down for days. Um, and it happened so often, probably five, six years ago, that you know it was a, a rather big issue here. And uh, luckily, I think we have learned and tried to, to overcome. It's not without problem, but something with major disruption is probably uh, reduced to a minimal at this point. But pollution affects the water quality. At the same time, when we talk about water security, it's not just about drinking water. Even the, the ecosystem, right? We talk about the, the overall... Uh, view on this uh, pollution will also affect right the ecosystem, marine life, and actually that will indirectly still affect water quality and later to the um, water that, that comes to our household. And um, another issue that Malaysia um, will constantly be, be talking about is the infrastructure. We actually have pretty good uh, water quality after treatment, right? Um, but the infrastructure that has been built um, will not ensure that water entering into household is actually directly drinkable, right? Um, it's, it's not not something that is uh, that bad that you get very ill, you know, if you drink any um, water from the tap. But definitely um, the amount of some of these, uh, um, let's say, um, I will call it... Uh, um, things that, that come along with the piping, the old, old aging pipes, right? And um, all these things, um, the issues of the water pressure is another thing that uh, some are facing in the country. And um, such things, you know, of course, affect the quality and also the experience of the water that we receive in household. Um, compared to, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, there's definitely improvement. But some of these things like infrastructure, you can imagine they are also not um, change right uh, regularly because there's no way that all the pipes will be dug out every five years to to replace just to keep the water clean. So I think such things uh, will be something we have to look into whether city planning right should all this infrastructure be planned properly that can you know be maintained uh, can last for, for a long time 
and even um, the infrastructure dealing with the water sources and all this are also um, issues that can actually uh, affect the whole right ecosystem right and the treatment capacity due to the increasing demand continue to also be an issue that you can see the capacity is constantly challenged and of course that will then um, impact the water supply to let's say a certain region um one final issue that I think we must mention um, is the issue of climate change. I think it's no longer unique to, to areas prone to floods or droughts. I think um, different countries, even they may not have experienced a sudden change of uh, weather and so on, are experiencing more and more today. That was uh, last week I was in Singapore and, and I heard people telling me they had actually a typhoon uh, issue that, that, you know, trees were, were uprooted, which this has really not happened in this region so drastically, but it happened, you know, just a few weeks ago. I think the, the whole climate change thing is a, is a warning, it's a sign that all of us must pay attention to, and actually climate change also will cause problems to water security, you know, through droughts and floods, and these are definitely issues uh, we should not um, look uh, on uh, lightly. So beyond just water issues, I think the challenges are, are not just what I've mentioned earlier. There are also challenges in terms of uh, governance, right? And uh, the availability of information. I think that's something that you would have heard from Dr. Pilar earlier. The amount of information that people can have access to, the information that we can gather in real time when it's scarce, um, that will bring challenges to how we may address or react based on some of these uh, issues that we may um, be facing. Um, thirdly, challenges around people is also important, right? Uh, are people aware of this? Do people get access to the information, to the um, situation, and even having the right knowledge, how to respond, how to handle, uh, let alone being responsible, right, uh, towards the usage of water? I think these are a few things are uh, definitely um, challenges we should pay attention to. Uh, we have talked about infrastructure earlier, but infrastructure is not just about the piping for the water, but also the infrastructure to manage um, the infrastructure that go beyond just water treatment, water supply, um, and even infrastructure that leads to what we see earlier, digital twin. I think these are things we should look into. And finally, challenges that every country will face is definitely in terms of dollar and cents. You know, what kind of resources uh, the country should prepare in order to handle all these challenges to bring the improvement needed or even to improve the quality so that people can benefit you know from um, such basic thing but yet crucial so i i want to share a little bit of uh, the the current state re with relevance to some of these uh, issues i mentioned earlier and this directly is taken from a report from the academy of science of malaysia uh, just two years ago, and I think you can find this online, so feel free to also read if you want to get access. And uh, again, I hope I kind of extracted the information correctly, so do point out if I miss out something, right? I think um, one challenge that we realize in the country, and I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's in the process of growth, huh, to put it in the right picture, and all these are issues we have identified that I know the government and the different um, people in charge, the different bodies are working towards solving some of this issue. But one issue that a country can face is definitely in terms of governance. And in Malaysia, classically, the management, the governance are actually um, kind of separated between the federal government and also the state government. And there are also privatization that then give different responsibility to these different organizations. But the governance and the management of them are also therefore fragmented that each of them take care of their own portfolio or their areas but the sharing right or the um, chances to work together and put the data together actually is something that is still um, not working as how it should imagine you know by not having all this data um, shared and consolidated together um, it's pretty challenging to make sure every uh, organization in different level, no matter from the city council to the state to even to federal, that they can make decisions together um, 
quickly, right? Based on data shared by each other. And this probably is worsened by some um, older laws that should be discussed and um, improved, right? Um, soon. But in the past, the data sharing law also restricts some of these bodies from just, you know, sharing them um, even within, you know, uh, let's say the, the context of, you know, um, better governance and operation. And these are the laws that we know lately in the recent years, governments already talking about how to, to allow some of them to happen more freely, at least within this entity, so that then um, crucial problems can be addressed if you have more complete picture, right, than having only bits and pieces of this information. So um, in, in terms of governance, you can see it's not just the infrastructure, but even law and how things are being um, done operational-wise. Uh, and all these things open up opportunity how the different entities can work together towards better governance and management. The information gap that I've mentioned also has to do with the um, challenges that the research uh, and development, uh, even innovation and commercialization that's short for RDIC. Um, this is probably similar that since the availability of the data and the information is uh, fragmented, is uh, limited, therefore the research, what people can do, um, especially from the universities, the higher education institutions, they only have that limited insights. And one problem that the report pointed out, the uh, involvement from the private sector um, is also limited, right? Um, and therefore, whatever work done is only based on what people can have access to. And as I mentioned earlier, that kind of consolidated um, available data that everyone can freely have access to, to work on all these problems is absent and therefore such thing also hindered some of this uh, research and solution right that may come from different stakeholders and therefore i think the, the availability of information is definitely one step that we must move forward and the lucky part is um, as you heard earlier with smart meters such data and the timeliness of data is actually something that can already be solved by implementing something as simple as having sensors and um, smart meters that people can now uh, consolidate the data to obtain such uh, information. And uh, I talk about people also. I think currently in, in our current state in the last two years and before that, um, the there's no platform where people, especially the general public, can say, I want to have access to some of this information so that I know what's happening. And therefore, the public participation, right? Or even can people be empowered to be involved in water resource management, all these are still quite restrictive. Um, it's not intentional, but I think until we can solve the problem in the data governance, the availability of data, then these um, people who are interested, who may actually have ideas, uh, will not be empowered. And therefore, I think that particular thing is also why, um, as we heard from the previous speaker, when you have now data that we can capture, and of course, um, process in a way and made available rightfully, lawfully to the um, right people, then you can see also more stakeholders can take part in understanding, in coming up with innovative solutions and that can potentially help us to solve all these issues. Infrastructure-wise is also another issue. And I think we are still more of uh, the sharing or even the interoperability right, of the infrastructure and even the cooperation, collaboration between different departments. At this point, it is um, to be improved, right? can be minimal. And another big issue, even if they want to work together, since data acquired separately, no standardization, therefore, a lot of work are manually done. If you have heard from the previous speaker, if we have a way to digitize them, and also work on the standardization of how data should be structured, stored, and processed. You can imagine we don't waste time sending or processing or you know, uh, working on the data, but we can jump directly to looking uh, at possible um, methods to, to find insights, right? And exchange and discuss this uh, data, and we can remove the costliness, right? 
of um, working on uh, more legacy and probably uh, fragmented data. And since I talk about cost, I think cost of data acquisition at this point, or at least up to a few years ago, to access some of this data is actually not just uh, difficult, but sometimes you need to buy this data from you know the, the uh, organizations in order to have access to it. And this, of course, make the access to um, some of this data um, more restrictive, um, which I think the improvement that we see in the recent years since uh, COVID is uh, the government's uh, move towards open data, which I think that is a very step. And by making some of this data available and uh, accessible by public, including also researchers and even students, you can see the potential and the possibility of innovation will come in. So I think just run through some of the, the um, issues that I managed to, to collect uh, um, and summarize in one of these uh, um, paper by Raman in uh, 21. You can see um, other issues that I didn't mention here include um, things like the unsustainability of the water resources. We talk about the non-revenue uh, water. The percentage is still very high and there has been actually effort um, by the different um, water um, utility company in improving this. And I think over the last few years, it has improved, but there's still actually much room to be uh, to, to, to work on. And uh, another part that I think I didn't mention earlier is definitely um, the wastage rate or even another issue. Some countries may have this also, that by helping the um, citizens, actually our water rate is relatively um, affordable. But sometimes when the water rates are affordable or even cheap to certain people, some may no longer feel um, the need right, to use this um, water prudently. And that leads to unnecessary wastage. And you can see that, again, increase the burden right, for the um, different organizations or, or companies to produce water, that all this takes up resources. Um, there are still quite some work that we can do in the um, preservation of the water catchment area. There are on and off um, problems like a destruction or deterioration of areas uh, around such a, um, important uh, regions. And whenever, you know, let's say some contamination um, happen, then that's where the issue of the, the um, treatment, you know, need to be shut down, uh, clean up and so on. And that causes uh, disruption, right? So all these are issues that we definitely have to look beyond just the, the water, but even uh, into the um, preservation or enforcement is equally important. Yep, and um, I think to go through quickly, I'm looking at the time, um, to find new water resources or uh, sources, right, is actually also uh, an issue. And uh, I know lately, right, some of the issues uh, we can actually work on, sorry, this part is already on how we want to achieve uh, sustainability, right, in the water, right? And uh, I think one of the solutions some are trying to do now is, can we actually um, not just utilize the treated water that can be safely drank as a drinking water, but can we have alternative water sources that we can now use for other purposes? So rainwater harvesting is definitely one good step that I know organizations uh, and some cities are doing that, right? Um, could be used for, for let's say, uh, watering the plants, washing and so on, that these are, you know, usable water, then we wouldn't need to use the treated water at all. And um, even wastewater, yeah, places, and I have even uh, discussed and heard from companies, especially uh, industries that are looking into solutions, how they can treat their wastewater, Right, industries actually also use a lot of water in manufacturing and so on. And the wastewater, if treated, can actually be reused for, again, not for drinking, but for any other purpose or even reused in the manufacturing process. And this can actually help to lessen the burden of the water treatment plant and, again, will indirectly right, help to solve uh, challenges in the water security. Um, the demand management is important, the awareness towards 
the usage, you know, the wastage that I talk about, all these other things we need to constantly do. And the government is doing that quite actively, especially with the digitization uh, project that is already uh, ongoing since years. You can see now many of the households users, the users have an app access to their, uh, uh, and also, of course, their, their payments. There are also then the awareness campaign information to help to educate what these things are there. Um, one part that I didn't mention so much, uh, the usage of uh, water in Malaysia will also include uh, the usage in agriculture. And sometimes the uh, efficiency uh, should also be something uh, one should look into to make sure that the water used there, again, you know, is efficient and can help the agriculture industry. And that, as I said, you know, all this all coming together will actually bring um, more, um, let's say, um, balanced and sustainable um, management of water in the country. And finally, I've mentioned this before, the pollution issues, we definitely need uh, strengthened uh, regulations. We need to be better in enforcement in order to reduce or even to stop uh, pollution. And that itself then will also be improving the situation that I mentioned earlier. So, um, yeah, I think infrastructure we, we have talked about. So the replacement of pipe and even the, the older infrastructure that, you know, if let's say leakage is happening, um, if you heard earlier by putting different sensors, um, you can actually measure things like uh, water pressure and so on. And all these are good information, not just about usage, but it can even give some hints to, let's say, leakage and all this, right, um, in a particular system. And I think the treatment plants and all this should also have um, a plan how to modernize, uh, maintain in order to keep up or even uh, increase the capacity as the population growth and all this infrastructure upgrade uh, would help us to be ready, right? Um, in terms of uh, water security or water safety. And finally, something away from the drinking water, but still um, indirectly has impact on, on the, the uh, household water is things like flood or drought. And I think we need to be better. In Southeast Asia, you know, there will be monsoon season. And even, as I said earlier, with climate change, even heavy rain will come uh, in the unexpected times. And the flood control infrastructure, early warning systems are um, techniques that we can apply that can help us to also be able to adapt to such uh, changes and challenges. Same thing with the drought resilience. There are also dry seasons, especially when it gets very hot, and uh, how to work on water storage problems, how to work on more water efficient agriculture. All these are the opportunities. So. Just coming to the, the closing and echoing what uh, Dr. Pilar said, the digitization is very important. And if you can apply the IR 4.0 technologies, you have heard from her earlier, the different sensors, data um, collection, infrastructure, all the way to creating a digital twin, allow us to understand better the gaps, um, predict and also model better so that there's efficiency, there's uh, enough um, time to detect any problem and can act on it. And all these things comes with all these technologies that I think you are um, probably familiar with, things like big data analytics, IoT devices. You can use crowd, uh, a remote sensing, right, from the satellites. And actually something very powerful is the um, opportunity for crowd sensing. Every user, every person can actually provide information for the decision maker to make better decisions and finally, you have AI, right, to create models so that we can manage and solve problems better. And I think having public participation is very important. And if we digitize the whole process, we should be able to then um, allow um, the um, public, right, to know more. And some may even come up with innovations that can help to solve uh, the water security problem. And of course, with digitization, R4.0, we can better monitor and even obtain near real-time information that helps us to 
you know, solve problems like resource, security, water quality, and so on. And for the operators, I'm pretty sure when we can digitize and capture all this data, it helps them to also build systems like decision support systems that then the operators can make better decisions quicker and more accurately. Yep, so I will not go through too much, but in this report, if you read up also, um, one of the report number three uh, actually suggested the country moving forward can consider or should consider an integrated water sector data center. And you can imagine this is a good suggestion that says all entities, no matter in federal or state level, or even in a city, municipal, they should find ways to have consolidated, centralized uh, data that all can have access to because water all in all is not just a city uh, isolated case. There are many things that are interconnected, you know, from different um, regions, different levels that only by putting the data together, all can work towards, you know, a common goal and then they can operate at an individual level more efficiently and accurately. Yep. So the different areas, I think we roughly talked through them. I will not repeat them at this point. Yeah. So I think towards that, there are four areas. I think I will conclude here. We expect if we can implement this right here in years to come, hopefully soon, I believe for Malaysia's uh, context, there's definitely a potential to have improved, increased uh, efficiency. It also helps us to be more resilient, especially with all these um, sudden weather changes due to climate change. And of course, we want uh, safe water. We want to improve water quality. And of course, we want the um, decision makers, the operators can make better decisions. To end this, I want to give everyone a, a picture of what I love to share about um, the city where uh, the university is. And also when you think such evolution of what we have talked about, how you know different countries may want to digitize, but it's a long journey. Let me share what um, the city actually tried to do over the years. Um, Sunway City many years ago is actually a ex mining land that what you see here, this is like almost 40 years ago. It's actually a big hole left after the um, minerals has been um, I think it's tin, right, being dug out from the ground. And it's a land barren and not really um, usable. But that's where the, the founder said, we will take over this place and rebuild it into a city where people can stay. And over the next, you know, 30 over years, you can see it has actually been transformed into a city with a lake, right? This is one of these holes that I... Uh, if you see the first picture I showed at the beginning, there are two holes. These are the two X mining um, place. And today, these are two lakes in the city. One is used for theme park, and this is where the residents uh, live around and also where the university can oversee. And you can see today it's a thriving city because effort has been put over the last 40 years to rebuild it into a city where people can live. And why I want to mention this as closing is because even the city now is looking into how we can tackle the problem of water security and conservation at a city level. And we built our own water treatment um, facility so that we can safeguard water security when there's a need. And this lake itself, you can see some of the stats here, it's now uh, having water treatment um, uh, facilities that we can treat the water from the lake. And to use that for the usage of the city and in terms of uh, if there's a water disruption, we can be self-sufficient. And uh, it's an effort between the group and also universities to look into this research. And also we want to look into areas like water safety and beyond so that this is a playground for us to work on such issues, but we can then expand it uh, beyond the city, the whole country, or even in the region to support the different efforts that we need to do. And what we managed to do um, to give everyone this uh, very hopeful message as closing is work started 2021. And we actually know, you know, that the water itself, you know, uh, has enough water coming in that we can actually use it, right? And there are also the um, system that, that they have observed that there are enough um, 
fresh water. Since this is not a natural lake, we have to make sure it's not stagnant water uh, all the time. Then um, this is a good sign that we constantly have fresh water from rain, you know, that we can collect, can treat them, and the water is safe and usable, uh, even up to drinking level. And more important thing is this lake, by putting in the right um, mechanism, we can even build uh, ecology that can um, kind of uh, build a diversity um, that, that can help to improve the health of a lake. And who knows, a lake that, you know, in an ex-mining place actually can turn to a place that there are today fishes and different uh, animals living in and around it. I think it's a sign that we want to tell the whole world if we put ourselves, our energy and mind together, we can actually um, change things, improve things. And here you can see, we want to demonstrate how uh, self-sustainable water uh, safety, water supply can be achieved through all this effort for a whole city. Yeah, with that, I would like to give a, say thank you for your attention and uh, welcome any uh, questions that you know love to share as much as I know. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Professor Lau, for this wonderful uh, okay, lecture. And you have uh, shown that that means how Malaysia is coming up and is and is okay working in the digital domain and also the Sunway, the Sunway city, right? I think that yeah. we have visited Sunway city and I know that the level of uh, work has been done to make it a, such a magnificent place to be. So, so we have some limitation in the time, so I will restrict... Uh, Still, I don't uh, see any much question in the chat. So what I will do, I will try to uh, try to offer two questions to each of you. Uh, to start with, I will go to Piler. Uh, Piler, my my question is that oh, well, that means we are seeing digital transformations in many of the domains, right? So, mm -hmm. so from your viewpoint, can you tell that okay, for the domain of water, right? How the digital transformation is a bit different okay, from the digital transformation in the other domain and 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 what are the the what are the what are the things we have to uh, okay think ahead in case of the digital transformation in water? Over to you, Pilar. Yes, thanks, Dr. Alan. Yes, I think there are several common things in the water sector to other sectors in the industry uh, regarding digital transformation journey. Uh, but I think there are some things that make the water sector different from others. Uh, I think uh, the first thing is that uh, really the water sector is very conservative. Uh, so <laughs> it takes time uh, to adopt uh, technology uh, and we have to deal with that. Uh, another thing that makes different the water sector to others is that uh, really uh, the infrastructure that is managed by the water sector is really huge. Uh, for example, regarding water sector, or drinking water networks, we are managing like thousands of kilometers in length, and this is the, and they are distributed geographically. So this is challenging also uh, for the digital transformation of the of the sector. Uh, and finally, uh, the water sector uh, is providing uh, an essential service. So uh, the water sector has to do everything in order to try to deliver water 24 hours every day because it's, it's not a natural resource for everyone. So I think three, these uh, three things uh, uh, make different the water sector from others in the digital transformation journey. But I think that we, we have to deal with that. And what we can do is like to uh, uh, show uh, the sector the benefits uh, that can be achieved uh, with the digitalization. Uh, and trying to uh, to start the digitalization not like a, uh, an end, like a, uh, we have to uh, embrace digitalization like a means uh, to finally uh, achieve some goals. So it's, I think it's very important try to start to define uh, the main goals or benefits. Um, for that purpose, I think it's very important to try to convey uh, the sector the benefits and so real use cases that they can achieve uh, if they start this digital transformation process. Well, while waiting, I think I add my my personal view. I said uh, it's new to me, but um, I, I think as I prepare, I, I realize the water digitization um, initiative is way more challenging than what I normally know, like for a factory, for a company, because you, you actually have things that are beyond the water ecosystem 
you even have to include things like the impact of uh, let's say climate right because the the water source come from the sky right and um there are so much uh, human factors inside that the usage itself can again disrupt the balance so it's it's not just beyond plugging a few sensors measure data and i can solve the problem i have to consider lots of variables and finally the the hardest thing which i think that's easy uh, that's not easy uh, this common in, in all this uh, transformation project the, the change management is very challenging you not only need to convince i agree that the industry is quite conservative or traditional because people have been doing it over the years imagine and it's not something you can change many things overnight but um, on the other hand, you also have to change the users, right? So that change management must be done uh, with patience, with a good kind of a plan, and hopefully uh, enough political view to get it through. I, I still have one or two questions. So uh, I would like to ask a question. Uh, so the question is, how can digital twins improve the efficiency and sustainability of water management systems? And what are some measurable outcomes seen in real case studies? Professor Ramdan is calling. I can answer uh, this question from my, my experience. Uh, so uh, I can say that uh, digital twins, as I said before, can like help us to face most of the problem regarding uh, water management, but specifically regarding sustainability. And efficiency, they can help a lot. And I can I can uh, tell you some specific examples in order to have a better understanding about how the digital twin can help us in these uh, like uh, topics. For example, regarding the uh, efficiency and sustainability of the system, the digital twins uh, can help us to reduce uh, the amount of water that we are using. For example, with a digital twin, we can reduce the non-revenue water. You know that uh, part of the non-revenue water is the, the uh, uh, is wasted in, in in leaks. So we can reduce the non-revenue water, and how? Because we can detect burst very very quickly. Uh, we can fix fix them uh, before they become like a a, a big problem and, and avoid uh, wasting a huge amount of water. So detecting uh, bars very quickly and fix them. Uh, we can also like uh, optimize the level of pressure in the network. So uh, we know that if we, if we have like high level of pressure, we are going to have much more leaks and much more water that we are wasting. So with a digital twin, we have a, a clear understanding of the level of pressure that we are maintaining. And we can also like uh, avoid high level uh, or high pressures in order to avoid leaks. And also, from the sustainable point of view, we can also reduce uh, the amount of energy. So reducing the amount of water that we are using and reducing the amount of en energy, we are like uh, contributing to the sustainability of the system. And regarding energy, what we can do is, uh, for example, optimize uh, the, pumping uh, the pumping schedule uh, of our system. For example, with a digital twin, we can like uh, uh, operate uh, the pumps when, for example, the, uh, the cost of the electricity is lower. In Spain, for example, we have different prices of the electricity, uh, lower at night and higher at, uh, in the morning. So we can just adjust uh, or we can uh, like determine the best pumping schedule in order to take benefit of these uh, different prices. And also we can like uh, operate uh, the entire the, the pumps in the uh, base point of efficiency that contributes to reduce the, the amount of energy. So. Uh, with these two things, uh, with the digital twin, we are contributing to to the sustainability of this of the of the network. And it's true that uh, mm, mm, the level of the rates that we can achieve, or the benefits in terms uh, uh, of percentage of water and energy that we can achieve, depends a lot uh, on the stage of each utility. But uh, between uh, five or or fifteen percent. Uh, it's like a percentage that can be achieved uh, implementing this kind of strategies. But it depends a lot uh, on the stage of the utility because if an utility has a really, for example, a, level, a, a very low level of non-revenue water, uh, really reducing this non-revenue water is going to be really difficult. If a if the utility has a high level of non-revenue water, these actions are going to be like a, a better uh, to achieve a higher percentage. But 
uh, anyway, if the utility has like high level of uh, or, or, or high level of efficiency or what uh, is the is the same is the same that a low level of non revenue water. Uh, using these digital twins, what are going to do is contribute to maintain them, because if not, they are going to be like uh, lower and lower and lower. Uh, thanks, Paila, uh, for your wonderful answer. Uh, so my ne uh, next question goes to Sian Lau. Uh, the question is, what are the potential barriers to implement digital water management solutions in Malaysia? And how can these be overcome to ensure long-term sustainability? I think the um, quick, quick answer to this is, is really what I, I learned and glad to see from the report that I cited in the presentation. I think the country through the Academy of Science have actually a, a rather good proposal. And as we all emphasize in this talk, the step, I think the phases to digitize them in stages will be the right direction that we can then solve some of the issues we, we have uh, discussed here. Um, in every country, I think it's the same. You, you can't overnight convert everything. I know um, it has been piloted before COVID in a certain uh, area near um, the capital. And I think now probably around the capital city at the state next to it, has actually smart meters installed. And now if the steps towards the digital twin can be um, achieved, then we are moving towards the direction of how, you know, we can at least do some of the things uh, as mentioned by Dr. Pilar. Um, but more importantly, uh, the challenge is still whether the users understand we all has a role to play. Often we think this is a problem of uh, the government or the utility company. I'm just drinking, it's not my problem, right? Um, but we didn't know whatever we do, we use today. Um, the water wastage thing is, is real in, in Malaysia, um, that we are just using more water than we should, right? And little things we do in our lives, if we can start changing them, actually coming as a country, it, it can actually, you know, we, we often say even improving by 5% is a big change if you, you know, count them day by day throughout the whole year. So I think all these are things we definitely need to start doing in order to, to move closer to a more sustainable country. I hope that that kind of summarizes, yeah. Thanks, Professor. I would like to uh, give the vote of thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. I, Dr. Jyoti Gautam, Associate Professor at NSUT East Campus, Digital Water Program Steering Committee member and Chair Digital Water India subgroup under the Digital Water Program of the International Water Association on behalf of the D Digital Water India subgroup. Would like to take the privilege of giving the vote of thanks. First of all, I would like to thank our esteemed panel of experts for sharing their valuable thoughts and outstanding knowledge in the domain of leveraging digital data for advanced water supply and sustainability. Uh, pilot, uh, pilot, Dr. Sianlan Law, Professor Amran Chakravarti for accepting the invitation and taking some time out from the busy schedules. Thank you so much to the entire panel of experts for really making this webinar simple and interactive to understand. Secondly, I would like to thank Aaron Jordan, Strategic Programs Officer, for accepting the invitation to open the webinar. Jen, India Regional Operations Manager, Prasanna Chukdev, South Asia Operations Manager, for the overall coordination of the webinar. And then I would like to thank Ms. Dola Gupta, DST Women Scientist and Secretary of Digital Water India Subgroup, and Dr. Nitama Malsa for taking feedback and preparing the flyer. I would like to thank the steering committee members of the DWI to support us with their intellectual thoughts for ideation of the webinar. Last but not the least, all the participants for taking time for attending the webinar by real realizing the importance of the subject of the webinar. Thank you so much for making it a grand success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Banzit. All. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Like, so, would you like to have a photograph, Dula? Uh, yeah, ma'am. I've already taken. Thank you so okay, much. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank, thanks, program. everyone. Thank you. So thanks, much. thanks, Pilar. Thanks, Sian. Thanks, Aaron, Jayan. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone.